we are in the theme, the elephant in the room, and uh, thank you for sending all your questions in. So many hairy, scary questions because they're anonymous. And some of the questions that came in, I was like, oh, I wish it wasn't anonymous. I want to know who asked that. Um, but it's all good, guys. They're all anonymous. Don't worry. All right. I actually don't know who asked the questions, but there were many, many questions. And tonight, I'm going to answer probably the most common question, and it was the question about sex and sexual preference and purity and not purity and all those issues came in again and again and again. And um, so I'm going to touch on that. Are you ready? Are you ready? And one of the quest- a lot of the questions actually was, why doesn't the church talk about blah, 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 blah? And as I was thinking about it, guys, I got offended that you asked that because, because, guys, I have 30 minutes every Sunday and I only have 52 Sundays a year. And so assuming you come every single Sunday, I might be able to address 52 topics for 30 minutes. But I do tell you every Sunday to read the Bible for yourself. And I do tell you to get into a life group because I've written a really, really deep curriculum. And I do tell you to get off your royal behind and start serving because you might actually learn some more there as well. All right, now I'll get into it. So, the world has a lot to say about relationships and how we should do them and what is acceptable and not acceptable. But I love that this theme has actually just really put steel in my own spine to go, you know what? The world may say this, that, and the other thing, but the Word of God says. Because in answering your questions, you know, a lot of the questions, and it's not just about sexuality, but a lot of the questions kind of are around this idea of how far can I go before it's too far? You know, how much can I get away with before it's not okay anymore? And God's like, Jesus always, he never got caught up in the nuances of the arguments. He always just went, boom, straight to the top and just raised everyone. And he's like, I'll raise you one. And this is actually where the answer is. And everyone felt called out. I'm like, oh, okay. Some people walked away sad. And so this whole concept around how to do relationships, how to do sexuality, how to do a life according to God's standard, not the world's standard. I want to tell you that when you become a follower of Jesus, you no longer do life what the world considers normal. In in effect, you are ruined for normal. And so there's this concept in the world that love is love. Love is not love. God is love. And so we can only know and do love properly when we know God and when we do it His way. And so the elephant in the room, how far can I go? What does God say about homosexuality? What does God say about sexual behavior? What does God say? Well, He says a whole lot in the Bible. You should read it. He says a whole lot in the Bible All the way from the Old Testament to the New Testament, God has a lot to say in Scripture about sexuality. It's in there. It's in there. And so the question should not be, how far is too far? That is the bottom of the barrel. If you're asking that question, you're asking the wrong question. The question should be, How can I be a living sacrifice for Jesus Christ? The question should be, how can the relationships I have best honor and worship God? Oh, no amens in the room. The question should be, is my life at 11.30 at night 
a place where the Holy Spirit wants to be a habitation? That's what the question should be. That's what the question should be. A few weeks ago, my newly transitioned teenager, Layla, who just turned 13 this week, she was, we're driving home and she said to me, Mom, there are some friends at school and they identify as being bisexual. She's 13 in a Christian school. I want to tell you, going to a Christian school or going to a church doesn't make you a Christian any more than walking into McDonald's makes you a cheeseburger. I mean, if you eat enough cheeseburgers, you might look like one. <laughs> See, I've been in the room, guys. Why can't I lose weight? Um, <laughs> preaching to myself, okay. Mom, there are, there are some kids in my grade that identify as being bisexual, and what do I do about that? And I was like, oh. happen to abstaining until you're married? Like, let's just forget for a moment about gay, straight, bisexual. Like, let's just abstain till we're married. And I said to them, is there anyone still doing that? And my girls go, yeah, we are. desperately praying that there are some boys out there who are also. You know, there's um, a young woman in our church family who's now married and has children. But when she walked in here, literally off the street, God drew her in because she was in the neighborhood and she was drawn into the building in a PM service. And I never take for granted the faces I don't recognize in any service because of these sorts of stories. And she was drawn in, dressed a certain way, and um, identified as bisexual, and been through so many ups and downs in relationships, all sorts of different ways of doing things, a history of sexual abuse, and she came in and she was welcomed at the door and ushered in and sat with every single week. And she encountered Jesus. She was healed and restored and experienced the transformational, restorative, healing power of Jesus. Filled with the Spirit of God, baptized in water, baptized in the Spirit. And now is one of the most phenomenal leaders in our church family. You would be shocked if I told you who it was. And so it's actually not a question about is it gay or straight or any of that. It's about the power of God to transform a life. Regardless of what the story, the backstory is. Because we all have a choice. That's the crazy thing about God is he left the choice up to us. He wrote, he wrote the rule book, and the rule book is not because he's mean and he's sitting up there with a big rod waiting to hit us or blow an umpire's whistle. The rule book is the rule book because when we live by it, we flourish and we're blessed and we come into blessing. But we have the choice on everything, whether it's gay or straight, whether it's lying or telling the truth, we have the choice on everything. It's just that one way leads to life and the other doesn't. And so I'm just going to touch on the three seasons, whether you're single, dating, or married, and what God says around those three seasons. And the first one is for all the single people. All the single people. And um, yeah, Beyonce, I can hear like thinking of it, I know. You know, and there are many different categories of singleness. There are young people who have not yet been married. There are people who find themselves divorced or widowed, separated. And so singleness is a powerful season. 
It is a powerful season. It grieves my heart when I meet Christian singles who are dissatisfied in their singleness. Because it is a, every season we find ourselves in has purpose. And if you are not walking in purpose, if you're walking with a, you know, a grudge, then you've taken on the role of the victim rather than the victor. There is a purpose for every single season. In fact, the Apostle Paul chose to stay single. You know the guy that we quote out of the New Testament because he wrote most of it? He never married. And he actually bragged about it. <laughs> He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, But I say to the unmarried and the widows, it is good for them to remain even as I am. But if you can't exercise self-control, let them marry, because it's better to marry than to burn with passion. We'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later on. But he actually preferred the single season. And he's like, if you're single and you choose it, you've got it going on. He chose to live his life that way. Why? Because he knew that he didn't have to account for anybody else. Like, we'll talk about marriage later, but it's a big deal to join yourself to someone. And he was like, well, if I only have to account for myself, then I can more freely do the will of God. And I want to tell you that if you're single, you should be running rings around the married people when it comes to your service in the kingdom of heaven. When you're single, you can focus on honing and developing yourself in Christ. Singleness is a time of intimacy with God. This is where you develop yourself, you put down strong foundations, and you get busy about the Father's business. Let your singleness be powerful for the things of God. You know, when my family broke down when I was 11 years old, we became born-again, spirit-filled Christians. My mom and us three girls, I'm the oldest of three girls. I was about 11 or 12 years old. And my mum made a decision when I was 11 not to marry. I was the oldest not to marry until we were older, much, much older. And she chose singleness for nine years. It was so hard for her financially, socially. But I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful because I saw her read the word. I saw her pray. I saw her prioritize the things of God. This woman could not be stopped. She took us to church. She took us to youth. She was literally mom's taxi. It was just her, her alone with three teenage girls for an extended period of time. And you know what? I will never doubt that I was a priority to her. That will never be a question. And I'm so grateful because what I learned from her was how to put your roots down deep and how to have your own relationship with God. How to be strong and stand on your own two feet. And I watched her do that. I'm so grateful for that. And it was difficult. But I want to tell you, things in the kingdom of God are not easy, but they're worth it. You will never listen. You'll never regret doing it God's way. No matter what it is, and no matter how hard it is, you'll never regret doing things God's way. You can focus your ministry to God and your ministry to others. Just do it God's way. Number two, dating. Does your dating have purpose to it? Do Christians even date? Like, is that a thing? Should that be a thing? Because dating in the world is like testing the waters, right? How gross. How gross. And church, I just want to let you know, is not a Christian dating service. Church is where people come and love God and live on purpose. 
Churches where like-minded people get together and serve wholeheartedly, all right? <laughs> if you do manage to find your spouse, I did, in church, that's a really awesome bonus. But really, that Christian dating season is a really important season. I want to say to you, don't mess around. Don't mess around. You need to date with purpose and intention. I said to Sam on like our first date, what are your intentions? I don't want any of this rubbish that was out in the world. It's like, okay, what are we actually doing here? Guys, please don't be friends with benefits. Like either be dating and committed or not. Please. The young adult pastor agrees because he has to deal with you all. <laughs> be integrous. You know, have integrity for yourself and the other person. Commit. Commit. Date with intention. Intention to what? Intention to marry. That's why Christians date. With the intention to marry. Are you still there? If it isn't for the intention of marriage, then why are you doing it? Why are you getting caught up with that person arousing their emotions, stirring their heart, you know, spending time being vulnerable. If you're not intending commitment, why are you doing it? Please stop. It's not right on the other person. And if you are with someone who's stringing you along, Say what? I don't even have words for that. <laughs> like, I have zero mercy gift. So if you come in and I see this on your life, I'm just going to go. <laughs> go and see Nicola. <laughs> Not Jared, Nicola. <laughs> oh, gosh. 2 Corinthians 6. This is big. This is really big. Do not be unequally yoked. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? My sweet friend, don't flirt to convert. <laughs> it hardly ever works. You don't want to take that risk. And you know what? You are worth a godly man or woman. You are worth that. Amen. Amen. Don't be unequally yoked. And so this is around purpose. Do you know I've seen two Christians who are unequally yoked? Many of my friends, both Christians, but going in completely different directions. And it's not, it's not a fun time. You can be unequally yoked even as Christians. You need to be on purpose together. Common kingdom cause. And you know what? Serve together. Sam and I, the, the more committed we got to each other, the more we served together. If anyone ever tells you, just pull back and focus on your relationship, that is the worst advice you can ever hear. I want to tell you, you cannot learn on the couch in the laying on of hands ministry <laughs> what you can learn in the house of God serving side by side together. <laughs> that is the worst advice ever. We actually wound upwards in our serving when we got more involved with each other. And because what you learn working side by side with someone, you learn their quirks, you learn their passions, you learn their personality, you actually figure out whether you can work with this person for the rest of your life or not. It's really, really important that you're equally yoked and you're on purpose together. It's important when you're dating that you honor when you're dating, it is pivotal that you lay the foundation of honor. 
You need to honor that person above yourself. I had this young couple um, that we were doing marriage counseling with, and he shared with me that he honored her dad's curfew to a T. In fact, he would get her home five minutes before the curfew every single time. And he said to me, it was because she's not mine yet. She's not my wife yet. I have no right to dishonor her that way. It's about honor. You need to ask yourself when it's 11.30 at night and you're doing something questionable, am I actually kissing someone else's future husband? Because he's not my husband yet. Is that the seed of adultery? Sorry, you asked the questions. Just giving you the answers. And the truth is, if you live according to God's standard, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed. I promise you. He's so good. Make sure that you don't do a single thing to compromise what God has in store for that other person down the track. You have no right to do that. It's written in the New Testament, Hebrews 13, the marriage is honorable among all and the marriage bed is undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. And so what he's saying is that anything that happens sexually within the confines of marriage, God's okay with. But anything that's done outside the confines of marriage, we receive judgment for. So be careful. Basically, sex outside of marriage is outside of God's plan. And it's not about how far can I go, all right? Because we believe in a God who we can't see. But imagine if you could. And imagine if he was sitting on the couch with you. Hi, guys. Uh, because he is. He actually is. He actually is. Mark 10 verse 8 says, The two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but they are one. This is so important. When you become one, you can't easily separate. That's why the breakdown of relationships is painful. And that's why it leads to so many other issues because of soul ties. You leave a part of yourself with them and they leave a part of themselves with you. It's called a soul tie. I remember a few years ago baptizing a couple in their 40s and he was he'd had two previous marriages and now was living as a de facto relationship with this lady and they chose to get water baptized and so we took them on a little bit of a journey and you know I'm just believing and speaking truth all the time and all of that and just believing God will speak when he speaks and so he let her be baptized first and she went down under the water and she came up and he says it was, might as well have been the audible voice of God say to him, she is not yours, you can't touch her until you're married. And now this man swore he would never be married again after two failed marriages. When he heard that voice in his spirit, he was like, whoa, then he got baptized and while they were living together, they separated in their rooms, separate rooms. And who knows, they signed the marriage paperwork and got married 30 days later. <laughs> but the truth is, when you do things God's way, it works. It works. And so be really practical about how you honor each other in the dating season. Sam and I always say nothing good happens after 10 o'clock. Dan reckons nine. <laughs> nothing good happens after that. Time alone in bedrooms and lounge rooms and cars. It's dangerous. You play with fire, you're going to get burnt. Set wide boundaries. Don't be like, how far to the edge can I get? Because if this is the edge, then I'm going to be right back here. Right back here. This is my line. I don't care what the world says. This is my line. 
And I'm going to honor God. I'm going to honor the Spirit of God so that I don't offend Him, so that I can walk with Him every day. Do you know, when you honor each other, your wedding day will be a Spirit-filled day. Do you want the Holy Spirit to come to your wedding? He'll be present there. It's a callback to purity. You know, I find it really hard. I have a marriage license, but I find it really hard to say yes to marrying people these days. Because there are so many couples that I've counseled who I found out later were not completely honest with me. And I find out later about all the issues that are coming up in their marriage. And you, you know, I, when I marry somebody, I take that so seriously. When I'm joining two people together, I'm, I, just, I just don't know if I can do it anymore. Like, if you're going to come and ask me to marry you, please know I take it seriously. If you're going to ask me to do marriage counseling with you, please be open and honest. Let's actually address the things. Save you a lot of pain after the rings on the finger. Let's deal with it now. Let's be really honest. There's no judgment. We can actually work some things out before the rings on the finger. Because when that happens, it's so, so painful. It's a call back to purity and to doing things God's way. And so number three, married. Married. Do you know the giving of yourself fully is what marriage is. Marriage is not two people 50-50. Marriage is two people 100%, 100%. It's all in. And there are so many people who get married now out of need. You don't want to get married out of need. You want to get married because you've done your single season so well that you're a man and woman of God. You know who you are. And this person compliments you. And you are now together taking the kingdom of heaven by storm. You're not doing it out of need. Marriage is a covenant of mutual submission and mutual honor and respect. God loves marriage. And marriage is supernatural. Marriage was intended to be supernatural. Marriage is the closest picture we have on this side of eternity to God's love for humanity. God uses marriage to describe his love for the church. God loves marriage. And Paul writes to the churches and he talks about the importance of marriage and how to, that a leader in the church should be the, wife, the husband of one wife. He talks about the value of marriage. Proverbs 18, my favorite verse in the Bible, and I use it against Sam all the time. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Right? So true. In Ephesians 5, writing to the church in Ephesus, Paul says, you know what, wives? You need to submit to your husbands. And the religious people love that verse. But the very next thing he says is, husbands, you need to love your wives the way that Christ loved the church and he died. So I've got to submit. You've got to die. <laughs> marriage is a mutual submission, a mutual honoring, completely, preferring one another before ourselves. It's a place where we fight for agreement. And there are many families that I counsel and spend time with, and I can always draw the drama back to a fracture in the marriage. No matter what it is, a fracture in the marriage. It could be the kids, it could be finance, it could be career, it could be offense. But where there's a fracture between the husband and wife, it affects the spiritual atmosphere. It's like this little crack that the enemy can get in. 
But where there is a couple who have fought for unity and fought for agreement, they may not agree on everything, but they're in unity with one another. And they fought for that. There's nothing the enemy can throw at them. Husbands and wives, don't ever, ever sleep in separate beds unless you've got gastro (laughs) or COVID. Don't ever sleep in separate beds. Ever. Ever. Don't ever, 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 ever sleep in separate beds. I don't care if World War Three just happened today. You better bring out the peace treaty before you go to sleep. You better humble yourself, both of you, and fight for that marriage bed. This is no joke. One night on the couch or in a separate bed is the doorway for unspeakable things down the track. Don't ever, ever, ever sleep in separate beds. Don't ever call each other names other than awesome names. Don't use painful, sarcastic labels. Just don't do it. Honor, respect. You fight for that marriage you've got. You fight for it with everything you've got. There is nothing more important in your world if you're married than having unity in your marriage. Because God loves marriage and he honors marriage and he uses marriage as an example of his love for the world. And you know what? A godly marriage is actually an answer to the world. The answer to all the world's problems are found in a healthy marriage. All the world's problems. We have nothing to say if we can't get it right here. But when we get it right here, we create a home and we create a space and we create shade for people to come into and draw breath from and draw sustenance from. It's so important. Marriage is supernatural. Marriage is a binding covenant. You're bound for life. Not only does God say that marriage is between a man and a woman, he also says that it's to the exclusion of all others for the duration of your lives. You know, I've heard that you can now enter into fixed term contracts of marriage. A fixed term 10 year contract. That's not a marriage. That's not a marriage. How funny is the world? Like, how confused is that? You become one. You become one. You're bound together eternally. On the inside of our wedding band, Sam and I got it inscripted in Latin, Jewish nos inxit, which means what God has joined together, let not man separate. There's no exit plan. There's no prenup agreement. There's no just in case or hedging my bets or protecting myself because husbands, you're meant to love your wives as Christ loved the church and he gave himself for her. He didn't self-preserve. He didn't hedge his bets. (laughs) He didn't go, oh, just in case. He gave himself fully, the ultimate sacrifice. I remember when Sam and I were dating and I was uh, a very passionate, um, explosive, emotional young woman. Yes. And um, this one time, you know, we had an argument on the way home. We're just dating, early days. And Sam dropped me off at the right time, curfew, good man. And he kissed me on the cheek. I'm like, you can't kiss me on the cheek. We're fighting. He goes, well, you can stay angry. I'm not angry. (laughs) And this other time, I said to him, because I'd heard it said, I've fallen out of love with you. You, We've heard that, right? We hear it in Hollywood. 
um, I said to Sam, will you ever fall out of love with me? And he goes, no. And I was offended at how sterile and immediate his response was. Like, you didn't even have to think about that. You can't mean that. He goes, no, I'll never fall out of love with you. You can't possibly know that you'll never fall out of love with me. No, I'll never fall out of love with you. How can you know that? Because love is a choice. And I was like, so you say you're going to have to choose to love me? And he goes, yeah, judging by that, probably. (laughs) But love is a choice. And I want you to know, there have been days where I've had to choose also to love Sam. (laughs) Love is a choice. Love is a choice. Love is a choice. And marriage is powerful. Marriage is something that brings blessing. It is a seedbed of blessing. But I want to tell you, every single one of the seasons, singleness, dating, and marriage done God's way brings blessing. It brings blessing.